the Zoom meeting um, 20 minutes into it so that 25 minutes into it so that we don't get any Zoom bombers because that already happened also during this series with Sayak Valencia. <laughs> um, so good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming and thank you for your patience as we got started. Um, welcome to this public lecture, part of the Mellon funded Sawyer seminar dedicated to thinking neoliberalism at the neopopulist crossroads. My name is Luciana Chamorro. I'm a postdoctoral research associate affiliated with the seminar. And it is my pleasure to be introducing our guest speaker for today, Professor William Massarella, one of the most exciting and incisive thinkers of the contemporary. I wanna thank Mellon Foundation for its generous um, support of this Sawyer seminar, as well as Lee Medavoy for directing the initiative. I also wanna thank uh, my colleagues and co-organizers of the Sawyer seminar, and most especially to Brooke Hotez and Peter Orr for who are our graduate fellows, um, whose work makes these events possible for us to enjoy. Um, the seminar has been gathering and thinking for several months now on uh, the process of neoliberalization and its relationship to the political forms with, with which it coexists. Um, under the broad rubric of religion, this specific seminar hopes to tread new terrain, considering what lies beyond economy in the apparent traction of, of populism today. Uh, William Mazzarella is in many respects a perfect guest for, for the session, a careful ethnographer and one of the most rigorous and generative, gener generative thinkers and writers in the discipline of anthropology. Today, Mazzarella's scholarship on mass publicity, advertising and cinema interrogates the foundations of sovereignty in mass mediated societies. His earlier monographs on the topics include Shoveling Smoke, Advertising and the Globalization in Contemporary India, which is an ethnography of the advertising industry in Bombay and the early, in the early years of the liberalized economy, and Sensorium, Cinema and the Open Edge of Mass Publicity, which is an analysis of Indian film censorship. Through his scholarship, Mazzarella has also offered refreshing interventions in, in debates on affect, aesthetics, and mediation, posing rather urgent questions to critical theory and to scholars of the political more generally. His latest book, The Mana of Mass Society, engages with the anthropological archive and with classic debates on religion, charisma, ideology, and aesthetics to reconsider what powers mass society, or in Mazzarella's words, what is in the social more than itself. This book invites us to consider the constitutive surplus of the social, raising questions about the political forms that it animates in the contemporary moment. And these are questions that Professor Mazzarella will examine today in relation to populism, um, as well as political theology and popular sovereignty, taking us with him as he explores what is in representation more than itself. With that, uh, please join me in welcoming the Newcomb Family Professor of Anthropology and Social Sciences at the University of Chicago, Professor William Mazzarella. Thank you so much, Luciana. Um, and thank you for everyone who made it possible for me to do this. Um, I'm, I'm really uh, very disappointed not to be able to be in Arizona right now. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, it would have been lovely to see you all in person and to get some of that sunshine as well along the way. But here we are, and um, I've actually come to feel that um, these kind of Zoom communities are surprisingly um, mm, generative of some kind of sense of co-presence despite everything, and it, perhaps especially now that we're all so uh, locked down into our kind of uh, more narrow world. So it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, and I am going to be sharing my screen with you. Um, just bear with me, I'm a little bit um, apprehensive about this actually working, but um, let's see. I have a PowerPoint that I wanna use. Um, let's see here. Uh, so, okay, so this should now be like more or less just a blank screen, right? Is that, is that what you're seeing? Okay, great. There's gonna be a lot of blank screen along the way. So I'm just, just warning you in advance, all right. 
Let's see, all right. So uh, I hope you'll indulge me. I have the feeling that in what follows, I will more than once be stating the obvious, but I can't shake the feeling that there's something about the present moment that cries out for this kind of movement back over very familiar ground. A bit like when we retrace our steps, looking for something that we've lost, as if precisely because everything looks so familiar, it's easy to miss something that should be obvious, but isn't something that's hiding in plain sight. You'll notice that as I go along, I won't really be defining my key terms, populism and political theology. I've made this choice quite intentionally on the principle that definition is too often a way of stopping thought rather than starting it, a way of convincing ourselves that we can stand apart from and outside of the process we're trying to describe. My approach will instead be to speak, as it were, in the neighborhood of these terms, to see what they might yield when they don't know we're looking at them. That said, I do want to say something about why I chose to include the term political theology in the title of this talk. Now, the, the phrase political theology is most obviously relevant of Carl Schmitt's work. For Schmitt, it's about the way religious concepts get thinly secularized so as to be able to do work as political concepts. There will be a moment or two in my talk when examples of that pop up, but that's not really what's animating me. Another version of political theology is when someone's using overtly religious concepts for political ends. Again, that's not irrelevant to what I wanna talk about today, but it's also not quite it. I'll confess that as I was thinking about this talk, as I was drafting it, I began to wonder whether I'd made a mistake by committing to the notion of political theology when my intuitions didn't seem to want to line up in the right place. But then it's often exactly when one is in this kind of mood that clues appear. I came across a passage in a chapter by Claude Lefort called The Permanence of the, Political, uh, the Politico-Theological Question Mark. Sorry, that wasn't supposed to happen. There we go. Uh, it resonated precisely not by giving me a definition I could work with, but rather by seizing me and leaving me feeling at once addressed and unsettled. I'll give you the whole passage from Lefort near the end of my talk, but for now, I just want to ex extract one line from it and let it sit for a few seconds. I'll then try to find my way back to it during the course of my talk. This is how the line goes. Every religion states in its own way that human society can only open onto itself by being held in an opening it did not create. Now, anyone who takes up the topic of populism immediately finds themselves in a place where not only definitions, but above all judgments are expected, good populism or bad populism, democracy or tyranny, hope or despair. For better or for worse, we're living in politically urgent times. It can easily feel like there's no time to waste. My own sense is that if scholars have something to contribute as scholars, then it has everything to do with insisting on the importance of slowing down, insisting on a different kind of attentiveness, on retracing our steps and looking again. And that in turn requires a kind of quietness amid all the noise which is not at all the same thing as quietism. So today I'm retracing my own steps back to the question of representation. Why representation? Because very often when people try to explain the populist wave that's been sweeping the world in recent years, they say that populism is the result of a crisis of representation. And usually what's meant by that is that people don't feel represented by existing political institutions. And so arrangements that have been relatively stable for some time become unstable and are called into question in the name of the unrepresented. The unrepresented may be the silent majority of the conservative imagination, or they may be the politically revolutionary part of no part, Jacques Rancière's term for those who are structurally excluded by a given political order. In mainstream democracy talk, the, world, the word representation generally comes paired with the word participation and then it's as if the two exist in a zero-sum relationship. More representative democracy means less participatory democracy and vice versa. I will in fact be taking quite a bit of time today or talking quite a bit today about representation and participation, but not in the sense that I just described. 
Instead, I want to offer the following proposition. Maybe it's not so much that we're dealing with a crisis of representation as a crisis in representation. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, that perhaps the issue is not only that people don't feel represented. More than that, very often the movements that are described as populist seem impatient with representation as such. If representation means mediation, then populist movements seem to strain past mediation as if they might seize the political directly, immediately. This is not at all an original thought. It comes up with some regularity in the populism literature. For example, Robert Samet writes, populism attempts to resolve the problem of representation by collapsing the divide between government and the governed. The claim of every populist movement is to embody the direct unmediated will of the people. Or in the words of Margaret Canavan, in populism, there is a strong anti-institutional impulse, the romantic impulse to directness, spontaneity, and the overcoming of alienation. Now, clearly, this populist push toward immediacy isn't always pretty. Its idiom is often summary violence, vigilante spectacles of instant justice. Thomas Blomhansen suggests that populist violence can serve as a sort of alternative currency, a general medium of equivalence for people who are disappointed by or excluded from other economies. And of course, this kind of summary violence, this kind of public violence, can generate powerful spectacles and significant sites of enjoyment. Any kind of efficacy, any power to act that exceeds or short circuits the law tends to be intensely charismatic. And it can be justified in the name of the people. Consider the words of one of Hansen's Indian interlocutors, a local politician. The majority of people are with me, they support me. So what right do they have to charge me with any crimes? I'm just speaking for what my people feel. Okay. So there's this element of pushing past representation, past mediation, toward a feeling of immediacy, toward a feeling of unmediated efficacy and presence. But then there's also something else, something that Canavan calls the redemptive dimension of politics, a dimension that she associates especially with populism. Redemption from the Latin redimere, meaning to buy back. But what is populism buying back and at what price? If the resonances here are Christian, then is some kind of unaccountable sacrifice implied? Usually the implication seems to be that what is being redeemed is the true promise of democracy, the will of the people or some such. But if you'll let me lean on Lacan, I want to propose that what is being redeemed is what is in representation more than itself. Now, I know this is a bit of a nomic phrase. Uh, Luciana already trailed it in the introduction. But I have a feeling that it will get us back to this question of representation and participation and how we might be able to think those concepts a bit differently. So let me just say it again. What is in representation more than itself? So about three years ago, I foolishly undertook the task of writing a review article for Annual Review of Anthropology on the Anthropology of Populism. In that article, I wrote that populism dreams of a direct and immediate presencing of the substance of the people, and as such a reassertion, a mattering forth of the collective flesh, where the matter is at once the sensuous substance of the social, the flesh, and the meaningful ways in which it comes to matter. I'm not being romantic about this. Obviously, this mattering forth of the collective flesh has taken on some pretty ugly forms in recent times. Writing in the wake of Donald Trump's election as president, Nick Tausig stressed the corporeal aspect of Trump's appeal. Tausig observed, the bland, boring predictability of president lawyers like Obama and the Clintons now have little to offer voters hungry for red meat. Trump was the rousing alternative. Here was a man, this quote Tausig, here was a man all body. The question then becomes, do we recoil from all visceral, all fleshy embodiments of the social just because some of the most visible ones are so repulsive? Or do we consider other ways in which matter can matter? Part of what I want to say is that what we're calling populism is something that we can only partly make sense of as long as we remain with the usual vocabulary of political theory, terms like democracy, the people, the state, and so on. When we say populism, I want to suggest, we are registering a kind of eruption, a bleeding through of the sensuous substance of the social 
into the conceptual space that we usually talk about in the ordinary language of politics. When I say mattering forth and bleeding through, I don't mean that the sensuous substance of the social isn't there all the time. In fact, no political order can function without inciting and containing the sensuous substance in a more or less routinized way. Every political order needs what my colleague and friend Eric Santner calls a formation of the flesh. But it's in moments of rupture, moments of, for example, populist upsurge, it's in these moments of rupture when those formations of the flesh come unstuck. Or to put it in my own terms, when the incitement of the flesh comes unstuck from its containment. And that's when the representations that we're used to understanding as conventional signs reveal their reliance on a vital collective archive. That's when the resources of that archive, what I've elsewhere called the, a mimetic archive, that's when those resources become available for redemption. That said, if that mimetic archive is us, if we are not substantially separate from it, then it's also not entirely clear who's redeeming what from whom. But hold on, isn't this whole dream of immediacy inherently suspect? Surely it's obvious that in social life, there's no such thing as immediacy. Surely we start from the assumption that everything is mediated. And isn't there something especially suspect about juxtaposing terms like redemption and immediacy? Doesn't this all smell a bit fascist? The queasy stench of what Theodore Adorno mercilessly used to lambast as the jargon of authenticity. Certainly, the redemptive tone of populist movements is often dismissed as regressive, as a kind of backsliding into theological atmospheres that shouldn't have any leg legit legitimate political place in modern mass democracies. Bruno Latour, for one, has no time for any immediacy talk. He says, a demon haunts politics, but it might not be so much the demon of division, this is what is so devilish about it, but the demon of unity, totality, transparency, and immediacy. Down with intermediaries, enough spin, we're lied to, we've been betrayed. Those cries resonate everywhere, and everyone seems to sigh, why are we being so badly represented? Columnists, educators, militants, never tire of complaining of a crisis of representation. Latour goes on to suggest that politicians today are peddling an impossible fantasy. It might also be the case that half of such a crisis is due to what has been sold to the general public under the name of a faithful, transparent, and accurate rep representation. And this is Latour's clinching claim. We are asking from representation something it cannot possibly give, namely representation without any re-presentation, without any provisional assertions, without any imperfect proof without any opaque layers of translations, transmissions, betrayals, without any complicated machinery of assembly, delegation, proof, argumentation, negotiation, and conclusion. This sounds so reasonable, so sensible. There is no outside of representation. What could be more reasonable than that? What's more, it seems especially ironic that populists should be conjuring dreams of immediacy, given that populism, like modern democracy itself, is an inherently mass mediated thing. If populism produces a cult of immediacy, then that can only be because it's so thoroughly mediated. As Peter Worsley wrote 50 years ago in one of the first sustained inquiries into populism, the idea that there could ever be a direct relation between the people and the leadership in a complex large scale society must inevitably be predominantly sheer mystification or symbolism. But then one wants to ask, if it's so obvious that immediacy is a fantasy and perhaps even a politically dangerous fantasy, then why is this fantasy so powerful? Why does it persist so tenaciously? If representation without representation is impossible, then why do we have to keep saying so? It must be that people keep getting it wrong. Perhaps it's just that people are dupes. It must be that people are simply deluded when they feel that glow around a leader, when they fail to see that politics can only ever be, to quote Latour again, opaque layers of translations, transmissions, betrayals, and so on. An understandable delusion, perhaps. People are desperate, people are angry, people want to make themselves present, but a delusion nevertheless. This is very much the liberal line on populism. As a good liberal, one 
understands the populist seduction, one maybe even empathizes with it, but one is scrupulously careful not to condone it. The liberal line seems all the more reasonable, all the more ethical even, because the forms of actually existing populist politics are so often so very hateful, racist, xenophobic, queerphobic, alterphobic in every possible way. But perhaps we shouldn't be so quick to take this step from the obviously objectionable political con content of right-wing populism to a wholesale dismissal of the redemptive, crit redemptive critique of representation. Perhaps there's an opening here to thinking differently, not just about politics, but about social life more generally. Raymond Williams' key words is often a useful place to turn when something doesn't feel quite right. And sure enough, Williams has an entry on the term representative. Williams shows that as early as the 14th century, the noun representative took on a double meaning in English. One meaning is the one we usually intend by the term today. The idea of a representative as a stand-in, a substitute for an absent other. For instance, the politician as a stand-in for the people. The other meaning of representative takes us in the opposite direction. There, representative means something that actually manifests or embodies what it represents. Williams's point is that these two meanings persist uneasily side by side in our uses of the term. A representative is at once something that compensates for an absence and that makes something present. Now, this ambiguous relation between absence and presence is, one might say, a characteristic symptom of the sovereign entity known as the people in modern democracies. This is a symptom that many theorists, all the way from Ernst Kantorowicz through Claude Lefort to Eric Santner and Jason Frank, have tried to theorize. When you have a sovereign monarch under God, you have a body that is two bodies. There's the body that is a contingent mortal human being, and then there's the body that's the immortal, sacred manifestation of the social order, the social body. But with the democratic revolutions, when the monarch's head gets chopped off and the people become sovereign, what will embody them? Lefort's answer is nothing. Democratic ethics, says Lefort, depend on insisting that the place where there was once a royal body is now an empty space, an empty place. This is Lefort's favorite, uh, famous formula. The locus of power is an empty place. It cannot be occupied. It is such that no individual and no group can be consubstantial with it, and it cannot be represented. Or perhaps we should say that it can be represented. In fact, it constantly is represented in various ways, but no representation will ever be adequate to it. No matter how big the crowd that masses in Tahrir Square or Zuccotti Park, it can only stand in for the sovereign people. It can never be the sovereign people. But then if we take Williams's etymology seriously, a representative, a representation actually kind of does a kind of double work. It both stands in for an absence and it makes something present. Is there something in there that can help us to think about the populist demand for immediate presence? Perhaps it would be useful now to come back to this idea that I invoked a little earlier. The idea that populism reminds us of what is in representation more than itself. Perhaps we now have one way of imagining what that means. The way that representation at once substitutes for something absent and makes something present. A deferral and a mattering forth. I said a little while ago that I thought that these moments of populist upsurge were a kind of bleeding through of the sensuous social substance into the conceptual field that we usually define as politics. I now want to suggest that we can think of this mattering forth, this bleeding through, as a radicalized kind of participation. By radicalized, I don't mean that it's necessarily of the left or for that matter of the right. It has nothing to do with political coloring. By radicalized form of participation, I mean something in representation that activates its vital substance from root to branch. So again, something like what is in representation more than itself. Sometimes provocation comes from unexpected places. More than a hundred years ago, Lucien levy Brule wrote a book in which he developed a theory about the difference between so-called primitive and so-called civilized ways of thinking. The book was translated into English under the now rather hair-raising title, How Natives Think, 
At first sight, Levy Brule's book traffics in the worst kind of colonial cliches. Civilized people, he claims, think conceptually, logically. Their way of approaching the world is analytic, separative. Civilized thinking, according to Levy Brule, is representational thinking. If by representational we mean thinking that takes a step back, that insists on critical pause. Thinking that understands that there's a difference between the word and the world. Thinking that insists that the relationship between the signifier and the signified is arbitrary. Primitive thinking, on the other hand, Levy Brule argues, fails to make that distinction between word and world. If civilized thinking separates things, then primitive thinking jumbles them all up. Primitive thinking is magical thinking. In primitive thought, word and world participate in each other. They share in the same substance. Words are not just signs, or perhaps I should say signs are not just signs. Rather, because words participate in what they name, words can also act on what they name. Signs don't just refer to the world, they make worlds, they summon powers. I don't need to go into all the ways in which this distinction is a rerun of classic Christian debates about transubstantiation. Does the wine of the Eucharist merely represent Christ's blood or does it actually participate in Christ's blood? Still, the theological comparison is important because it helps us to see that the story that Levi Brule tells, a story that is ostensibly a story about differences between civilized and primitive ways of thinking, is actually a debate about an ambiguity that is internal to modern ways of apprehending the world. I use the word apprehending here advisedly. Apprehending means understanding, but it also means seizing or arresting. And there is that nervous undertone too, the apprehensive mood. A way of apprehending the world also implies a way of grounding authority. And at the same time, an anxiety about the groundlessness of that authority. The authority of the church, and the authority of the secular state. In fact, Levi Brule himself makes all this quite clear, if only in passing and only right at the very end of his book. After hundreds of pages designed to hammer home his point about the yawning gap that separates primitive from civilized thinking, Levi Brule turns around and remarks that the kind of substance participation that is supposed to be the mark of primitive thinking is also alive and well in so-called civilized societies. And as it turns out, precisely when it comes to religion and politics. He writes, and I've added emphasis to a few passages here, collective representations which express a participation intensely felt and lived, of which it would always be impossible to demonstrate either the logical contradiction or the physical impossibility will ever be maintained. The vivid inner sentiment of participation may be equal to and even exceed the intellectual claim. Such in all aggregates known to us, are the collective representations upon which many institutions are founded, especially many of those which involve our beliefs and our moral and religious customs. The collective representations of the social group, even when clearly pre-logical and mystical by nature, tend to subsist indefinitely, like the religious and political institutions of which they are the expression, and in another sense, the bases. Right-wing populists, especially those who don't shy away from religious appeals, are of course particularly good at evoking this kind of affect. Against the disenchantment of secular liberalism, they conjure a vital continuity of substance. Consider the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi's riposte to his secular rivals when he said that, for them, the Ganges is a mere river, for me, Ganga is Ma. Note here how Modi's line is at once pious and affectively lavish. Also the way it code switches between the river's secular sounding English name and its sacred sounding Hindi name, between we could say representation and participation. It would be too easy here simply to explain this effect simply in terms of an explicitly religious politics. The more interesting question is to understand how this element of charismatic participation can just as well erupt in the most apparently secular places. In fact, charisma is an originally theological term that we use today, generally in so-called secular contexts. Whenever we want to describe those moments when something sublime seems to emanate from, to shimmer through something human made. Emile Durkheim argued that this was what ritual was for to incite and contain this kind of charismatic emanation. 
Durkheim's point was that without inciting and containing these energies, we would have no durable social life. Nick Tausig picks up on a passage from Durkheim's Elementary Forms of Religious Life, where Durkheim writes, in general, a collective sentiment can become conscious of itself only by being fixed upon some material object. But by virtue of this very fact, it participates in the nature of this object, and reciprocally, the object participates in its nature. Now, of course, we have all kinds of critiques of how this kind of thing is a mystification, how it's the ground of ideology, idolatry, and fetishism, and so on. All these critiques present themselves as tactics of de-alienation, ways of putting humans back in control. But two things seem important in this passage. First, the principle that society can never be, as it were, self-sufficient, that it can never be immediately present to itself. This, by the way, is also an article of faith for Claude Lefort who insists that no society is self-imminent. Durkheim's point is that any kind of consciousness is only possible through the detour of a representation, but also, and this is crucial, that this representation works by participating in the substance of what it represents. And in that way, it does that double work that both Raymond Williams and Levi Brule in their very different ways noted. At one level, the representation is a stand-in for something that it is in itself absent. At another level, and at the same time, it makes that thing present. And I think it's worth underlining here that Tausig's point in reading Durkheim is to tell us that modern social theory, secular as it seems, is actually organized around an occult kernel. Tausig writes, the epistemic basis of the science of sociology that Durkheim was forging depends completely on an unacknowledged yet profoundly magical notion of the sacred correspondences. Tausig is talking here about the magic of participation, again, what is in representation more than itself. And this is a scandal for thinking democracy, because after all, leaving magic behind is part of what is supposed to separate liberal democracy from divine kingship. I was talking a little while ago about Claude Lefort's uh, formula for an ethics of democracy, the empty place of power. Let me just revisit what Lefort wrote. The locus of power is an empty place. It cannot be occupied. It is such that no individual and no group can be consubstantial with it. Lefort's formula would seem to be explicitly designed to push back on any move toward a totemic revival, any attempt to reinstall a charismatic representation in place of the people. At one level, this is just a pragmatic necessity. There is no circumstance in which the entirety of the people can be manifested as such. Hence, it becomes, in a secular way, sinful to try. But there's more to it. Any attempt to represent the people directly isn't just, a fraud, isn't just fraudulent because it takes a part and makes it stand in for the whole. There's also the problem of the affective dimension of the sign, which is to say, the problem of participation. Or to put it another way, it's not just the fact that I might identify with the representation of the people that is inevitably partial. It's also that I might enjoy that identification and enjoy it intensely. Lacan had one name for that kind of deliciously rapacious enjoyment. He called it jouissance. Durkheim called it effervescence. So then a question opens up here about popular sovereignty, the sovereignty of the people. What happens when that enjoyment, that jouissance, that effervescence, no longer has a clear point of focus in a totemic sign or in the body of a monarch? What happens when that enjoyment is, to use Eric Santner's expression, no longer incarnated, but rather excarnated? When the sovereignty of the people doesn't so much become an abstraction as a kind of distributed flesh. Santner's expression, excarnation, doesn't mean a sublimation of what was previously the body of the monarch. If anything, it means the opposite, that the sensuous social substance precipitates or falls out of an earlier formation of the flesh and is now at issue everywhere, loose affect, le corps morcelé. And because what we call populism is, I think, a renewed claim on the flesh of the people, populist politics has a way of poking its finger right into the wound. But why is the wound so sensitive? Jason Frank points out that the problem of how to embody democracy ritually in what he calls a living image of the people goes back at least to the French Revolution. This is what he writes. The revolutionary festivals aim for a kind of theatrical non-theatricality, an effort to make the people present to themselves 
but purportedly without artifice and corrupting mediation. And through this revolutionary self-regard to instill into the senses and the heart of the people, the civic myth and religion of popular constituent capacity. In other words, the aim of the ritual and its images was to remind the people of their power, but their power as a potentiality, something always in process, something always becoming, something imminent. The danger, and this is where the anxiety about idolatry rears its head, is always that an image will come to stand in for the people, not as a constituent capacity aimed at the future, but as a con constituted thing already completed. 230 years after the events he's describing, Frank still considers the warning necessary, perhaps more necessary now than ever. It's a mistake, he writes, to see crowds, assemblies, and mobs as direct expressions of such popular constituent sovereignty. They remain an image and potent political representation, but a living one. Yes, great, a living image. But then what is this living? What is this life that an image takes on? Where does it come from? What does it feed on? A Marxian critique of fetishism would say that the life comes from us. We're the ones who do the work that breathes life into what would otherwise be a dead letter, an inert sign. But then why is it that some letters, some signs are more able to provoke our desires, our imaginations than others? Ernesto Laclau argues that populism is the alliance against the common antagonist of a diverse series of demands in the name of the people. And such an alliance only becomes possible, Laclau argues, because of a sign that resonates, a sign that binds, a sign that is general enough to cover the diversity and yet particular enough to come alive. I say come alive, but it's not until very late in his life that one gets the sense that Laclau is at all, all that concerned with the element of effervescence, the living part of the living image. Laclau's partner and collaborator, Chantal Mouffe, has in recent writings pushed this point further, arguing that populism, whether on the left or on the right, can't live by deliberation or even agonism alone. It has to be animated by an affective supplement, a libidinal investment. In short, it has to awaken what is in representation more than itself. But isn't this a violation of the ethics of the empty place of power? Isn't this just the worship of graven images all over again? Then again, if any world has to be affective in order to be effective, then how can that affect find a focus in an empty place? As Mick Tausig once asked, how is it possible to emote an abstraction? Clifford Goetz refers to the inherent sacredness of sovereign power. And if sovereign power is inherently sacred, then Goetz adds, it follows that a world wholly demystified is a world wholly depoliticized. Note what Goetz is saying here. He's not saying that a demystified world is a disenchanted world. That would only be a tautology. He's saying something more than that, that a demystified world is a world without politics. For Goetz, the element of participation is not a magical manipulative add-on. Rather, without it, we have no politics. It is, to modify our phrase, what is in the political more than itself. At this point in my argument, we're exactly at odds with the secular critical line on populism. I'm thinking here, for example, of Andrew Arato's complaint that populism with its charismatic images amounts to a regressive re-enchantment of hard-won secular principles. Arato insists that any kind of living image of the people, any kind of mattering forth of sovereignty as body masks an authoritarian impulse, that it flirts with a quote, justification of dictatorship. The populist hunger for a new body, a body of the people to replace the body of the king is, for Arato, inherently anti-democratic. It amounts to an ethical failure, the failure to live with the empty place of power, which in turn is a failure to be properly secular, which is also to say properly modern, and to fall back instead on the aesthetic force of what Arato deplores as rhetorical devices bereft of rationality or, not to put too fine a point on it, to fall back onto magic, onto the superstition of substance. Fall back, precisely, because what's being assumed here is a linear historical progression from superstition to reason. And if one is committed to this argument, then the cure can only be more and more vigilant secularization. Arato doesn't mince his words, 
The only cure is, he writes, the further secularization and disenchantment of political concepts, the preservation or reestablishment of the secular and rational character. In that respect, at least, B.R. Ambedkar, the great leader of India's Dalits, formerly called untouchables, would have agreed. In a 1949 speech to the Indian Constituent Assembly, Ambedkar declared, Bhakti, which is to say devotionalism in religion, may be a road to the salvation of the soul, but in politics, bhakti or hero worship is a sure road to degradation and to eventual dictatorship. Now, Ambedkar certainly had good reasons to be skeptical of the ideology of Hindu devotionalism, but the straight line he then proceeded to draw from devotional ritual to hero worship, to political degradation, to dictatorship is no less ideological. Something curious happens in these attempts to grapple with the living image of the people. It's as if we end up being pulled back and forth between extremes. On the one side, there's the image of the authoritarian leader sumptuously fused with the people, with the land, the leader's very name and incantation of community. Indira is India, Fidel, we are all Evo. Groups of Modi supporters turning toward the camera at the same time, masked, every one of them wearing his face. This kind of thing is often described in terms that really haven't changed since Gustave Le, Bon's, La, uh, Gustave Le Bon lambasted the idiocy and childishness of crowds back in the late 19th century. And we saw it all over again with the storming of the capital um, a few weeks ago. A political science article on Latin American clientelism published in 2004 contains these lines, and I quote, as mere people in the plaza, we get caught in the leader's sway and are glad to give them our devotion, relieved that the king has come to save us, comforted that we are able at last to surrender our troubles to a higher being, unquote. Nothing new here then. Even though the overall orientation of this article would count as progressive, when it comes to charisma, it's just the same old participation as regression a regression back into childhood, away from mature political judgment. But how do we tell the prophet from the demagogue, being that they summon the same powers? Faced with this deep ambiguity, it often seems that the only way to save charisma, the only way to make it seem progressive, is to imagine it as a kind of radical imminence, an absence pregnant with the possibility of becoming. World-making powers gathered and waiting to happen, but not yet the pure potentiality of the multitude. Think the images of Occupy, the crowds of the Arab Spring, and so on. These too are powerfully energetic and charismatic images. If the charismatic leader is a figure of plenitude, a figure of frightening fullness, then these corresponding figures of democratic crowds are radically empty in the sense that their charisma depends on their standing for pure potentiality, for the assembled flesh as such. Tom Mitchell makes this point in an essay on the images of the Occupy movement. He argues that the images of both Tahrir, Tahrir and Occupy shared, quote, a conspicuous insistence on an anti-iconic, non-sovereign image repertoire, unquote. It's as if these images insist, Mitchell argues, precisely on representing non-representation. The emphasis is on, quote, the figure of occupation itself, unquote. Unlike the personality cults of populist leaders, these images are, Mitchell says, quote, not those of face, but of space, not figures, but the negative space or ground against which a figure appears, unquote. Through assembly, a clearing opens. The Occupy movement, Mitchell says, quote, refuses to describe or define in any detail the world that it wants to create, while showing this world in its actual presence as a nascent community, unquote. Something deeply troubled lives here, in this place, where the social substance matters forth into a space that can be recognized as political. And in fact, this ambivalence has to do precisely with substance, with what it might be, where it might be in relation to what we understand as the social and the political and what it might become. As an anthropologist, it's interesting to me that we have lots of dynamic ways of thinking about substance and its potentialities when it comes to soci societies that we can categorize as in some respect other. But when it comes to theorizing the mass democracies of the global north, it's immediately as if substance becomes a principle of inertia, 
and embarrassment. I find the following take on substance from Amy McLaughlin's work on the indigenous Witoto people of Colombia, both beautiful and resonant. Substance is the foundation of possibilities for affective resonance and transformation, for being affected in the dynamic attunements that constitute moral and generative intersubjectivity. It's a question, an open and urgent problem of cosmological, ecological, social, and moral organization." Unquote. At one level, McLaughlin is making an argument about a specifically Witoto conception of substance, but there is actually no reason to think that the way she renders substance is any less applicable to the forces and openings that give rise, for example, to US or Indian democracy today. Obviously, different folk understandings of what makes and activates social life are at work in each of these situations. But I would also suggest that our academic folk theories of democracy seem oddly, I want to say anxiously, invested in making something that is full of unruly life seem as inanimate as possible. And as always, when something is disavowed, the symptoms aren't long in coming. Consider the ambivalence of Slavoj Žižek's responses to populism. In one article, tellingly called Against the Populist Temptation, Zizek goes out of his way to warn us against the risk of granting any kind of positive substance to the figure of the people. In that piece, it's as if he's strictly committed to observing the ethics of the empty place. But then a few years later, responding to Occupy Wall Street, Zizek goes exactly the other way. By placing a ban on the image of the people, he asks, are we not simply being good self-castrating liberals? A few minutes ago, while thinking with Tom Mitchell on the anti-iconic images of Occupy, I said, through assembly, a clearing opens. A clearing opens. I want to pause and linger with this phrase for a little bit, sensing that the phrase itself might signal a moment of clearing in my talk. And this brings me back to the passage from Claude Lefort that I promised you at the beginning, because that passage too is about an opening, a clearing. This is what Lefort writes. What philosophical thought strives to preserve is the experience of a difference which goes beyond differences of opinion and the recognition of the relativity of points of view which this implies. The experience of a difference which is not at the disposal of human beings, whose advent does not take place within human history and which cannot be abolished therein. The experience of a difference which relates human beings to their humanity and which means that their humanity cannot be self-contained, that it cannot set its own limits, and that it cannot absorb its own origins and ends into those limits. Every religion states in its own way that human society can only open onto itself by being held in an opening it did not create. Philosophy says the same thing, but religion said it first, albeit in terms which philosophy cannot accept. When I first read it, this passage hit me with great force, although I was unable to explain why. In fact, each of my attempts at explanation seemed to miss whatever it was that resonated, seemed to reduce it. I suffered the usual scholar's impulse, that is, I tried to locate Lefort's words in a theoretical landscape, to note and acknowledge and perhaps develop possible resonances with Heidegger's ontological clearing, Lacan's mirror, Deleuze's plane of imminence, Arendt's space of appearance, the Freudian unconscious, and so on and so on. But then I realized that this is exactly the wrong thing to do, exactly counter to the spirit of the passage, because what stirs and unsettles me about Lefort's words is that they insist on a difference that, as he puts it, goes beyond differences of opinion. A difference that relates, he says, human beings to their humanity, and quote, and which means that their humanity cannot be self-contained, that it cannot set its own limits, and that it cannot absorb its own origins and ends into those limits." Unquote. This is not to say that the thinkers that came to mind don't grapple with precisely these questions, some of them do, but it is to say that I would be missing the point if I simply herded the provocation that I had experienced in reading these words back into their terms, and in so doing, tamed the provocation, settling it within an already familiar economy of thought. Just as political theorists all too often tame the provocation of populism, trying to force it back into the schema of democracy as we think we understand it, only to find that it insists on sliding around, both agreeing and refusing, appearing now as the very lifeblood of democracy, now as its nemesis. 
Not surprisingly, my second impulse was to find a social scientific interpretation of Lefort's phrase, specifically of his statement that human society can only open onto itself by being held in an opening it did not create. From a sociological standpoint, by which the social is taken, the taken for granted baseline, by which the social is what makes everything, the statement doesn't make any sense, or rather it can only be read as symptomatic of another underlying truth. Perhaps it really means that human society can only open onto itself by being held in an opening it doesn't know it has created, or that it hasn't created, but its predecessors did, or that it hasn't precisely created, but rather maybe deposited, or maybe it's that human society hasn't created it because it wasn't human before it encountered it or something. You can see the problem. Each interpretive gesture is an attempt to do away with what, from a social science standpoint, feels impossible in this sentence. Unless we are to allow it its own truth, a truth that might then have to be called something like theological, and then we would in sociological terms simply be mystified. Except that, as I was arguing a little while ago, there is this peculiar occult element of participation right in the middle of Durkheim's canonical sociology of religion. Ostensibly, according to this theory, religion is supposed to be a reflection of society, which is, as Durkheim puts it, sui generis, unique unto itself, irreducible. But actually, there is this mimetic leakage right at the core of the whole thing, this substantial participation that flows both ways between society and the image that, to use Lefort's terms, allows society to open onto itself by being held by it. Like so many of those who write about populism, Lefort warns of the totalitarian potential that lives in this theological dimension of the polit political. But unlike the secular critics of populism, he doesn't conclude from that that our only hope lies in doubling down on the project of rationalist disenchantment. This is what feels true to me in these lines of Lefort's. They're neither rationalist nor romantic. They acknowledge that the vital and the fatal come from the same place, even as the possibility of hope depends on our being able to pass one from the other, step by step, day by day. And in this work, we are, I believe, always animated by archives that are not of our making, but by which we make ourselves. Thank you. Thank you so much, William, for this wonderful presentation. Um, now we have some time to have a Q&A. We have about half an hour of time. Um, so if you have questions, uh, please put your name in the chat box so that we can um, set up a list. And in the meantime, I guess I'll take advantage of my uh, duties as a, the curator of this, this session to ask a question of my own. <clears throat> um, and the question is, um, so if the world has never stopped being animated um, by magic, so to speak, what is it about this, this particular moment in time that has made it um, so revealing of what you have called the mattering forth of the collective flesh, um, expressed in the proliferation of assemblies, the return of the father, but also the popularity of charismatic uh, religious movements across the world or other scenes. <clears throat> and I guess more specifically, what might be the relationship in your opinion between these forms um, or the, be, between uh, the, the, these sites of appearance and uh, the process of neoliberalization with which it seems to be kind of coterminous or happening sort of in parallel times um, it, without doing like a like a uh, a linear kind of clearly the talk has has kind of put into question the idea of you know secularization as as a linear thing um, so what is it about the contemporary moment that uh, makes us so profuse um, with uh, with these forms of, of eruptions of the collective fresh flesh Right. Well, so thank you for the question. Um, I guess I have a couple of things to say. Uh, one would be that, you know, part of my argument is um, to come back to this term of Eric Santner's, you know, formations of the flesh. 
Um, and also to come back to the way I was thinking with Durkheim on ritual as a kind of organization of the of collective potentiality as a kind of incitement and containment. And I guess one way to think about this is that, you know, in any given place and any uh, given history, we go through phases where uh, we seem to have a kind of more or less stable kind of organization of collective energies and potentialities for a while. Uh, the kind of crisis in that particular dispensation. And, um, and I think in those moments of crisis, often there is a sense that um, society is once again, kind of whatever you want to call it, magical, irrational, charismatic, uh, you know, those things are kind of moving around in unpredictable ways. And there's a tremendous amount of anxiety about their movements and about the forms that might be found to harness them or to, um, to sort of tie them to particular kind of political projects. And, you know, this is one such moment. Uh, there have, of course, been many earlier ones. I mean, one, one only needs to think about, you know, moments in which, uh, for instance, like spiritualism becomes like a craze sweeping across the United States in the middle of the 19th century, or moments right before World War I, where there's a kind of, um, fashion, a sort of craze for like vitalist understandings of the social and of the political and so forth. You know, just to give you two examples of kind of moments in which maybe there's a sort of sense of a heightened attunement to uh, collective energies and collective forces, which takes uh, forms that many people see as kind of magical or irrational. Uh, my point being that, um, you know, those forces are always there. The question is just uh, what kind of um, social and political mediation they're harnessed to. Uh, it's, it's such that we can kind of forget a lot of the time that they actually constitute the possibility of the social and the political. In terms of the question of, uh, about neoliberalism, um, this gets a little bit into uh, some of the stuff that I've been thinking about around Trumpism and, uh, you know, I know we're going to be talking about some of this stuff in, in seminar tomorrow, but, um, but sort of the, the formula that I kind of developed for thinking about the relationship between sort of Trumpist jouissance and the neoliberal was to sort of think that, um, to think of the neoliberal moment as a kind of ideological effort to sell a kind of enjoyment of economy. You know, the idea that one could like actually feel effervescent or sort of elated about the idea that like the market, the figure of like of the economy could actually function as a sort of meta principle of uh, social life. Um, and that one would have a kind of elated confidence in the expertise of those who put themselves forward as kind of the salespeople and the you know, and the sort of great commanders of this kind of social formation. Um, you know, I think that's, you know, that's kind of what's come unstuck in the, in the sort of, in the Trump years and what's followed and which gives rise to this curious effect where like, as I think I say in that piece on Trump, Trump appears both as a kind of crisis of neoliberalism and as a kind of like, apotheosis of neoliberalism at the same time in this sort of curious way. So yeah, so that's just kind of brief response to, to your question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we have a lineup of, of questions, um, starting with Hi Ren, um, and then we have Robert, and uh, I'll be calling names. So uh, hi, you can go ahead and, and ask your question. Okay, um, thank you. And thank you for the wonderful talk. And uh, <clears throat> I really like you weaving together all those different theories and, uh, you know, from different historical periods, different disciplines, different regions. The, the question I was thinking about to ask you is, uh, has to do with your uh, conclusion. You were, kind of a, uh, when you quote, um, when you talk about this idea of opening, clearing, clearing. And uh, so initially my response was thinking about Heidegger's notion of ontological clearing because 
of the philosophical genealogy through this phenomenology, then you actually convince me that's probably not the way to go. Then you also talk about social sciences. In the end, you give me an answer that kind of surprised me. You turn to theological, right? But then I was thinking about throughout your talk, there seems to be implies something that is empty, that is absent. That all has to do with this non-sensual aspect of the things that uh, things in themselves, let's just using the Kantian term, you know, the realm of uh, non-humans, right? So I'm wondering, like in the history of philosophy in many fields, thinking about politics, ethics, quite a, and religion, of course, the, 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 the figure of God or theolo uh, theological is often a way of thinking about ethical issues, right? But then what about the, the non-human round as a potential reading of that possibility? But then I can't convince myself. I said, well, what about populism, right? That's a sociological, that's a problem of the social, right? But then I was thinking throughout your talk, you constantly try to hint there's something other than the sensual aspect. I, I just curious, uh, how do you respond to my uh, question? Is it possible to consider, you know, like a, a Pavanali called a geo power or, you know, non life uh, related issues in this understanding of populism? Thank There's a you. lot there. Maybe you, maybe you could just briefly say a little bit more about uh, how you see Beth Povinelli's argument relating to this, because I haven't. I have to confess, I haven't read the book, so I don't know what what her take on this is. Oh, I thought uh, maybe uh, when you give the talk at Columbia, she actually was there and asked you the she question. Wasn't. Sorry. Okay. No. Um, I think what she's trying to do is to link biopolitics to uh, the politics of uh, non life forms. So uh, both are connected together. And that's the basic argument. He also ties to uh, the, um, um, the discussions of ontological term in anthropology, indigenous mm -hmm. uh, rights movement, land movement. Uh, and all those issues. So in some way, I think uh, the problem, what I see, I could read slightly differently when I read your uh, version of, uh, print version of your talk, you know. And uh, I find it very interesting. So the everything you use, social society, I can totally just say, can we say this is a, French situ situation of society or American situation or even a Chinese situation. I'm just thinking either one seems to be working in some way, but it, you know, but then what about the indigenous uh, uh, kind of a society? Would, not, would that actually work? Or maybe it's simply something we can say non-human, from non-human society, that is also implies that is connected to the human society. I think that's the argument she's uh, hint. I haven't finished reading her entire book, but that's the framework she's suggesting. And I also yeah. want to add, since you mentioned about Latour, he recently talked about regimes of planetarity, which is also similar to this. Uh, he doesn't really say, uh, he doesn't use geo power uh, connecting to bio power, uh, power, but he's tried to connecting this uh, different regimes of understanding of the earth as a livable, uh, um, um, livable, habitable, habitable mm -hmm. uh, earth, right? and how different things fit together and how that affecting 
both human and non-human. So I'm just wondering, uh, do you have any thought? I, I don't know if I give a clear explanation. I'm also thinking through those things, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, I mean, it's really a wonderful set of provocations. Thank you. And, and I feel like uh, I can't possibly do justice to all of the things that you've raised. But I, I guess I would say a couple of things. One is that um, the figure of human society being held in a kind of space that is not of its own making or a clearing of its own, but that is not of its own making is of course now powerfully intelligible in terms of climate crisis and in terms of a kind of uh, ecological imaginary. Uh, and, you know, a lot of the people who have responded to climate crisis from the perspective of the social sciences, I'm thinking of people like, you know, my colleague, uh, Dipesh Chakrabarti, for instance, um, have, have raised this as a problem of kind of the displacement of the very scale and kind of ontological presumptions of the social and the historical and so forth. Uh, as a kind of challenge to ch challenge to thought, and so there is a resonance there with I think what I'm what I'm trying to think about, but I think my, I guess my sort of, um, how can I put this? My slightly contrarian gesture in relation to this is to say, but hang on a minute, this is already the case with the very notion of the social itself. Right, that there's already a kind of way in which the very notion of the social itself is constituted by something that is not like that can't be encompassed by the social. There's a kind of uh, there's a kind of extimacy to use a kind of Lacanian term, a kind of simultaneous internality and externality in in the very notion of the social. And that's what I was trying to get at also with this ambiguity of the term representation. You know, whether the term representation, which is supposed to be like in in our ordinary ways of like thinking the social, like yes, the social is constituted through like some regime of representations or like some symbolic order or something like that. But if we think of a sign or a representation as simultaneously being presence and absence, then it's like, you know, then that question of like, well, what is this actually made of? Like, you know, and furthermore, why are some of these forms uh, productive of enjoyment or jouissance or effervescence and some of them not. Like what's going on in that experience of activation, of vitalization uh, in those moments? That's where I keep coming back to as well, like how this has to be something that we have to be able to account for in terms of the way we think of the social and the political. Uh, because it's not just a question of like orders of representation or like, hu like human scaled symbolic orders or something like that. There's like, there's other stuff going on in there and there, and there always has been. Again, it's like climate crisis or populism. These are like moments of jolts to established ways of thinking that force us to, as it were, confront something. But that something has always been there. It's like it's not as it like it's always been constitutive of the very things that we've sort of understood as kind of comfortably social or comfortably political. It's just that most of the time we've been able to ignore that. So, so yeah, so that's just, you know, a quick response, but there was a lot more in your question and I, yeah, anyway, thank you. Um, thank you. So now we have Robert. You're still here, Robert. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, it seems to me that society and the representation of it becomes oxymoronic in that we have, we as a society cannot represent that image without the help of an outside image, which leads to a crisis in representation. We cannot maintain ourselves despite wanting to go towards stability. So if we are torn between collectively or working towards stability, but individually working towards a destruction, we come to this, we become this contradictive force. Why is it that our own representation in our own society enables ourselves to want it gone like everything else? Why are we able to make something so complex that we don't want it to exist anymore? Um. Hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about how to answer your question. Uh, 
I mean, I think one premise of your question is that uh, society rests on representations that are external to it. But I think what I'm trying to say is that representations are external to themselves. Um, that is, representation, rep representations are themselves unstable. Uh, representations, especially if they're powerful and they do social work, that is to say that they actually vitalize something, they bring something into motion, um, are unstable. They are uh, in the process of becoming, they're in processes of emergence. Um, and so I, I see what you're saying, that there's a kind of, as it were, a kind of psychological ambivalence around that, right? That there, on the one hand, there's a kind of longing for stabilization, and on the other hand, there's a, a kind of frustration with any form of stability because in a sense it's sort of inadequate to the, to the project. And I think that that's, I like that formulation too, because in some ways I think that one of the mistakes that we often make is to think that uh, well-functioning social orders are in fact stable, like stable systems of representation. Whereas in fact, I think it's precisely the, the mobility, the vitality, uh, of a set of representations, which is also to say their potential instability that makes them fascinating and that makes them sort of, as it were, available for um, the investment of desire, for the investment of, um, uh, you know, identification and enjoyment and so forth. So, uh, so yeah, so that ambivalence around the symbolic forms that make society possible is, I would say, like structured into the very notion of what is an efficacious sign, what is an efficacious representation. Thank you. Thank you. So we have uh, Sohai Khan. Uh, hi, uh, thank you, Professor Mazzarella for that fascinating talk. Um, what I was listening to you, I was also thinking that, I mean, in some ways, the problem of representation is like a part standing for the whole. And uh, when you talk about populism, I mean, one of your major interventions here is that here we see representation and participation, you know, assimilating into, uh, into each other. And uh, I mean, this gesture of assimilation and going again, unraveling that binary, especially through your work has helped me think about how mimesis or imitation is understood in the Islamic tradition. I'm just gonna give an example and then ask the question. So for example, there's this idea of, you know, the religious symbols, wearing a whale or sporting a beard. In the Islamic tradition, I mean, the term that's used for this kind of imitation is tashabbu. But there the emphasis is not like, you know, the entire community or a populist crowd representing or creating an efficacious representation of what it means to be Muslim. The emphasis is on the individual. And the idea is that by sporting a beard, I am already participating in a sense of, you know, embodying the persona of the prophet. But at the same time, I'm representing what it means to be Muslim. So if I, if I think about this in terms of, you know, how the part stands for the whole, I was just curious as to how you would compare this to, you know, the notion of populism, where an entire crowd is representing something. Whereas in another case, you just have an individual that can stand for representing an entire community. Uh, I think any political order or social order has certain forms of um, visible ethical comportment that allow an individual to appear as, as it were, um, exemplary um, and uh, as the, you know, the embodiment of a norm or, a, or an ideal. So I don't, you know, I think that's, that's kind of built in. I think in some ways, the question of the people, though, raises a very specific kind of problem of representation, uh, because it, 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 it is like the notion of democratic popular sovereignty is based on, uh, you know, as I was saying, this notion of kind of the excarnation of sovereignty, right? That it's like the, you know, it's the, it's getting rid of the singular body as the, as the uh, incarnation of, of sovereignty. And instead, assuming a form of sovereignty that is, uh, is distributed and, and as it were disembodied and yet sensuously palpable, right? In the forms that people experience participation in something like democracy or you know, sovereignty. And the crowd, the crowd is like the paradigmatic and like overdetermined form through which that 
kind of impasse between disembodiment and palpable experience sort of uh, happens, I think, in, in, in democratic societies. And that's why it's a site both of such um, effervescence and kind of idealism and the site of such anxiety and, um, and terror, right? Um, because it's the very place that in which like the ideal of kind of distributed flesh is manifested, but also in which like the disturbing fleshiness of the, de the democratic kind of is reasserted in ways that are often, uh, well, that are either appear as a kind of um, fantasy of, you know, uh, democratic upsurge. You know, I, I always think of those kind of images of, of kind of democratic crowds like surging into squares during the Arab Spring and so forth, and how those images were, you know, widely disseminated as kind of, they were supposed to kind of immediately signify democracy, right, in some way. Um, and yet, at the same time, you have the kind of immediate grabbing for the term mob to describe what happened at the Capitol in January, right? The, this pejorative word that carries with it a whole history of, you know, all these prejudices about irrationality and the failure of citizenship and, the, you know, a kind of illegitimate embodiment of popular sovereignty. So, I, yeah, so in response to your question, I guess my thought goes to the problem again, you know, which is a central theme in the talk, you know, this problem of the embodiment of popular sovereignty and, and you know, how to, how to think about that and the ambivalence that sort of constantly hovers around that. Thank you. Um, so we have uh, Sara Espinosa. Okay, hello. So thanks for your talk. Um, so I had a question that might be a little bit, um, I guess, uh, how do you call that? Um, <laughs> it's just related to my own interests. So it's, it might be like not very generous to the talk specifically, but um, I don't know if you're familiar with this um, scholar called Zainab Tufeki, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, um, but she has this book, Twi Twitter and Tear Gas, that does mention um, the Arab Spring and like different of these kinds of uh, kind of like mass gatherings where of people and especially her her thesis is related to like digital technologies and social media, so. Um, I was wondering like what you think of that in terms of like this kind of like usually social media or technology as thought as this mediative like mediative substance and how maybe also like somehow technologies kind of like shape somehow the possibilities of representation of the social or how representation of a social is conceived like in terms of like the form or even the conduits and the metaphors and even like the circulation of affects like I don't know the temporalities of the circulation of affects and I know that her thesis was more like the social media what it changes is like there is um, some sort of relationship between uh, the crowd and the signal that it this can send as a crowd. So it's a very kind of like computational ontology, like information science-y way of understanding this relationship of representation and signaling towards uh, some sort of like idea of power or like the power that be, that is like being fought by or being kind of like uh, opposed by these uh, crowds. Um, so I, I was curious about like what you think of that, like the problems of mediation in representation specifically as they relate to technology, talking about Trump. So maybe there are kind of like, there's like kind of archetypes of the father and issues of 
paternalism and the sovereign that kind of come up that seem to be like a temporal somehow of this kind of like this excessive constitution of the, the excessive of the social but also like how there might be some like differences in these representations depending on these kind of like technology mediation so that's my question thank you um yeah a couple of things i think that um the question of crowds has always um also like the question of crowds in political thought um social science has always been also a question of mediation right because the the very the very fascination of the crowd is that it has this aspect of immediacy um of people coming together body to body like actually being in one place together and doing something together and often the image is one of a kind of unmediated co-presence where like you know bodies start acting in unison and there's like a sort of collective movement that is not even like you know planned or conscious or whatever so but but the other side of it is that crowds have always been conceptualized in kind of dialectical relationship with publics right so and publics have, of course, like since, you know, you know, Habermas's influential formulation in the 60s, but but much earlier, even like people like uh, Gabriel Tard, who was a sort of theorist of uh, imitation, mimesis, but also of, of publicness, you know, uh, around the turn of the 20th century, was thinking about this kind of uh, the ways in which publics are constituted through media through uh, press publicity, but uh, have the capacity, as it were, to turn into crowds. But likewise, crowds sort of have the capacity to, to, to turn into publics. And so to think about the ways in which these, the relationship between kind of a figure of immediacy and a figure of mediation sort of operates in part as a way of kind of, um, what's the word, um, purifying, uh categories like crowd and public now in terms of the social media thing and crowds and kind of more recent stuff yeah i mean i you know i i'm thinking a lot with um work that's being done by anthropologists like um Zainab gersel and uh karen strassler and uh nusrat chowdhury and people who are thinking about like politics of crowds um, and thinking with, with media technologies. And one of the really fascinating things about um, social media and kind of, you know, smartphones and crowds now, of course, is that cr people in crowds can be conscious of, of like themselves as a crowd, sort of imaged from outside in real time as they're in the crowd, right? So that there's a way in which like the experience of sort of the immediate being in the crowd can also, as it were, paradoxically, immediately be like immediately experienced. So uh, what that means for politics, I don't know. But it, but I think that like you know, in terms of a kind of ontology of the crowd uh, and of uh, the question of mediation of crowds, um, it's it's really interesting. It's really interesting that we can kind of now like experience ourselves in real time as we participate in like crowd events um, as a crowd and yet all like individualized at the same time like looking at our smartphones um then of course there's the other aspect of what kind of data mining and like facial recognition and you know algorithmic surveillance protocols are being you know facilitated through this kind of uh intersection between crowd activity and, and social media. But that's, you know, that's not really an, um, an area of expertise of mine, but one that I find very interesting. Yeah, thank you. Perhaps we have time for one last question from Ragini. Thanks, Luciana. I was going to say, if we needed to let uh, William go, I don't mind holding, but do you think we have time? It's fine with me, if it's fine with everyone else. Okay. Um, well, let, let me ask that I'll try to be brief. And I and let me also thank you, William, for a beautiful talk. It's always wonderful to read you and hear you. And um, I think the form of this talk in particular, you really uh, allowed us to think with you. Um, you know, and I, and I and I really, really loved it. Appreciate it very much. 
So um, I was two comments you made earlier on in your early on in your talk really struck me. One was um, about the distinction between the crisis of representation and a crisis in representation. And then um, you made an, you made a note that you know we also need to really think quite carefully about what we're doing as scholars, right? Intervening in thinking about this particular set of issues, thinking about the contemporary moment. So I found myself um, sort of thinking about the scholarly responses to crises of representation that I'm familiar with or that are maybe over familiar to many of us. And the one that kept coming to mind was strategic essentialism and the strategic uses of essentialism as a response to crises in representation, as a response to failures of representation. Um, I'm thinking in particular of you know, the, the failure or the inadequacy of the category woman or the catacristic nature of the category Asian American or something like that, right? So these are very over familiar debates from a certain moment in thinking about um, the impossibility of representation even. And so this is kind of an inside baseball question, right? As far as um, academic conversations uh, and maybe very specifically in certain fields, but why did the project of strategic essentialism fail as a kind of critical project? Maybe, it, maybe, maybe that's like too strong a question and it didn't fail, but um, is it maybe because there wasn't enough jouissance or there wasn't enough magic? Um, this might be totally barking up the wrong tree, but, but the good thing is you can cut it off if you, if you think it's a horrible question. Well, I, you know, like there's a kind of smart alecky sort of response to it that occurs to me, which is that, you know, maybe it's not that it failed, maybe it's just that we realized that, so, that like the social as such is a project of strategic essentialism, right? Like maybe there's like a way in which like the very notion of a kind of stable, uh, like a po possibility of a kind of stable social order is a kind of strategic essentialism, right? That we need to like, as it were, pretend that these representations can be used in a kind of stable, uh, you know, reassuring way for a particular kind of ideological or social purpose. Uh, and that's just like the way that representations work. Um, so so maybe, it, like, it, maybe it didn't fail, maybe it just was such a good idea that it then turned out that in fact, that's, that's what society is. Um, but, but that doesn't really answer the question of like what happened to the critical project that was, uh, that motivated the, you know, the movement to, to make the argument for, uh, for strategic essentialism. Uh, so I wonder if you have a thought about that. I might need to, I might need to, to, think, to think more and, and um, I mean, I'm thinking in particular about certain, certain kinds of, I mean, I, yeah, I, I think I, I'll, I'll try to make it into a slightly better baked thought, but certainly I think some of the debates we have today about identity politics, right, really kind of, um, some sort of noxious debates, I would say, um, that might actually be in line with some of what you're diagnosing in terms of certain responses to populism. I, I'll see if I can suture them together and, 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 and think a little bit more about it. Because I, yeah. because my question does start with a question about the critical projects, right? Um, and, the, and the categories and brands and names in which we then speak and from which we theorize, which I think is, um, you know, and maybe specifically using the language of brands and names. Um, along with some of your other writings. You know, I, I don't know that this is really an answer to your question, but it does seem to me that one of the reasons why maybe the, the problematic of critical, um, sorry, of strategic essentialism sort of petered out a little bit is because it seems like the figure on which it relies is a figure of recognition, right? Like that it really like you need a kind of, you need to mobilize a representation of identity strategically in order to secure a certain kind of recognition. Uh, and there's a kind of acknowledgement that it's not the real thing. It's like, it's a compromise. It's a, it's a stereotype. It's complicit with all kinds of problematic narratives, but it like does the work of like carving out a horizon of recognition, access to resources, um, whatever it is, right? Like a certain kind of political place. And I, mm -hmm. I wonder if um, there is something in your question about jouissance um, that 
that sort of puts pressure on that, right? That like, you know, insofar as we're now thinking about social and political projects in terms of questions of enjoyment, in terms of questions of effervescence, elation, jouissance, whatever, like the, the sort of vital and energetic side of the social and the political, maybe like the logic of recognition is like feels like it's, I don't know, like it's, it's, it's a different problematic. It's maybe like not, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but there's, there seems to be a kind of incommensurability between those, those like ways of thinking the political. I think so. I mean, I think something about what you said about the desire for immediacy. If you, if you are already present, maybe you don't require, you can sort of also short circuit the sort of the, the desire for, rec for recognition. And it may be also that as you, I think are intimating that the, um, the sense of ennui arising out of debates around identity politics has also done something to undercut this kind of analytic of um, strategic essentialism, maybe. Um, well, I think we're sort of at, out of time. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, William for being with us this evening and thank you everybody who joined in. Um, so we'll see some of you tomorrow for our seminar session. Um, and if not, um, stay tuned for the next events of the Sawyer Seminar to be taking place uh, next month in April. All right. Well, thank you so much to everyone. Really, really a pleasure. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye.